Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Allie. Um, I lead the advanced storage team at Seagate, and we are going to talk to you a little bit today about Kinetic. Um, the Kinetic Drive was introduced yesterday. We have some big news this week. It's the first, um, the world's first Ethernet and key value hard drive. Has some really important, big implications for all of us for storage and for total cost of ownership in storage. Um, we're going to actually do what people say you're not supposed to do on stage. We're going to do a live demo. So Jim and Ignacio are going to come up in a minute. But first, I'm going to take you through a little bit about what it is and why we're so focused on object storage. Um, first, we did the press release yesterday announcing the drive. Also, um, really significant industry support coming along. Some of you may have heard we introduced the technology first a year ago. Um, and that was really for the purpose of bringing the ecosystem along with us. We work closely with SwiftStack, with Scality, lots of other partners, Ink Tank, Red Hat, um, because this is truly a fundamental leap forward in storage. And it requires not just that the devices are new, but also the software stacks and the systems. So we're really, uh, this is an industry movement that's happening here, and we're really uh, proud of how far it's come. So why are we so focused on object storage? Um, Kinetic is all about object storage. And the reason is, um, if you start with some all pretty standard industry numbers about the zettabytes of data that are going to be created in the years to come, 44 zettabytes is a fairly common number, 40, 44, in the year 2020. Um, and then further assume that a, about a third of that is probably valuable to companies if you can store it. So you're at 13.3 zettabytes. If you put 56% of that in the cloud, which is the forecast, you're at 7.3 zettabytes. And 90% of that is unstructured. It's object data. So 6.5 zettabytes of data that wants to be stored if it could be. The problem is it wants to be stored, but it can't be. Because with today's architectures, even commodity gear, there's a budget gap somewhere on the order of about $240 billion, even assuming dollars per gig declines as they have historically done. So we think that for all of us as an industry to realize the opportunity that sits in front of us, we need to totally rethink what the storage architectures look like. And, what, and, and to start with that, we have to start from the device, right? Because you need a different device if you want to do the rest of it differently. So just a very simple picture of what most um, storage architectures look like today. You have object storage applications at the top. Um, they are forced, because of the way the stack works, to sit on top of file systems that are today, for these use cases, mostly overhead. And then they sit, they talk to storage servers in a rack, and then ultimately to devices which are tethered by SAS cables, because that's the only way you can connect to a device today. But what's true is that this architecture, and especially these middle layers, were designed for very different use cases, um, in some cases as much as several decades ago. And we think that today, these applications are just trying to put objects and get objects, predominantly. And yet, they're going through all these layers of kind of machinations to get to blocks and sectors and then do the same in reverse. And it's inefficient from a software perspective, and it's very costly from a hardware perspective. So Kinetic breaks that paradigm um, and lets those object storage applications talk directly to devices as first class participants on the network over Ethernet, standard Ethernet. And the way we do that is two key things. So the device is still a traditional 3 and a half inch standard form factor device. Um, it now speaks Ethernet instead of speaking SAS. So we've added a little chip to the device. That chip does two important things. It speaks Ethernet, and it does the space management on the device. We've also added a key value interface. This is really important. Um, the, two of the, the combination of those two things let us eliminate the file system and the storage server. So what used to be two-tiered systems in all cases, whether it's Swift, Ceph, Scality, any of these object storage systems, can now be a single tier. Right? So now the picture looks like those object storage applications at the top, they communicate to devices through open source tools that we have provided and that are now community projects. Open source API, Kinetic is fully available under the LGPL, as are a series of libraries that are designed to let, that, let the API be easily implemented and integrated into software stacks. Runs today in Swift, runs today in Scality. We're going to show you Swift in a little bit, as well as Ceph, Basho, React, HDFS, a number of other applications. And 
you talk directly over Ethernet, over the open source API, to devices that are attached anywhere on the network. Um, today, what we announced, yesterday what we announced is a four terabyte hard drive, that one's sitting right there. We're also gonna show you a cool technology preview of an SSD. It's designed to be the first in a class of devices from both Seagate and any other device manufacturers and across tiers of storage, right? What people need is an object storage protocol that enables total disaggregation of storage from compute. And that has really important um, benefits that go along with it. Principally TCO. So when you pull those storage servers out of the rack, right, because you now have devices attached to Ethernet, you can eliminate a lot of CapEx, you lower the power of the overall system, you lower the human costs of managing those systems because you've removed this higher order failure domain from the racks, right? So if a server goes down, it's no problem. There's another server somewhere else that can fire up and talk to those devices. And if a device goes down, no problem. That data is erasure coded or replicated and it can be easily recovered. So OpEx is a big impact. Performance also benefits. Many of the use cases we see in object storage is people trying to kind of fill the can as fast as possible. And the servers end up being a bottleneck, especially as people get more and more efficient stacking tons of devices behind, behind servers and optimizing those servers. Suddenly it's a bottleneck. Now instead of having that bottleneck, you, ha you can gang up a series of devices across the ethernet and really um, op open some of those choke points. In some cases we're seeing as much as 4x the performance. And on the TCO side, um, lots of data points, I'll talk to a couple in a minute, but anywhere from 30, 40, 50% up to 75 or 100% in some cases. Rack density also improves for people who are space constrained, pull out all those object stor storage servers and put in more storage, right? So that's a, another important benefit. And then finally, um, device innovation. Many of you are probably familiar with some of the industry transitions that have been painful in the past device level innovation that needs to happen for things like improving aerial density, those are hard because host systems need to accommodate them. They need to adapt and change file systems and so forth. Shingled magnetic recording is the next one that's coming. We need to do that to get you guys 20 terabyte drives in the future, but it's gonna be hard because all the host systems are gonna need to change. With Kinetic, we've changed the level of abstraction to the device, so now, the object, the application is just putting and getting objects and we worry about the space management. And therefore we've broken that tight coupling and we can innovate at the pace that we need to. You guys, the host systems can innovate at the pace the system wants to innovate and those two things can happen independently. So architecturally much more agile and flexible. So um, one case study I wanna uh, showcase is kind of indicative of how these customer conversations have been going. Um, as I mentioned, we introduced the technology first a year ago. We have been working long in advance of announcing the drives yesterday with customers and partners. This is an example of a case study that we did with our partner SwiftStack. Um, and this is indicative of the customer conversation. So remember, this is all about scale out object storage. So people are not coming and saying, run iometer and show me your absolute highest you know, benchmark workload. What they're saying is, my performance requirement is X. In this case, it's 50 megabytes a second. So show me that you can deliver me that performance and then tell me what the cost is gonna be, right? So in this case, the customer said, my performance is 50 megabytes a second. Um, my networking infrastructure is actually one gig, so I have an upper bound of 120. Show me that you can meet that. We tested four different configurations, even in the worst case with very, very small object sizes, which is not very practical. We meet their performance requirement. Okay, in all the other cases, we actually exceed their networking requirements. So they, they check that box and they say, okay, this is interesting. Now tell me about the TCO, right? And it turns out that in this particular case, the impact is maybe as much as 36%. And remind you, this is not against traditional OEM gear, right? This is against Swift on commodity systems. So the fact in this customer's case, what they wanna do now is say, I can store 36% more data. It's a life sciences company. They know exactly what to do with that data. And now they have the opportunity to get a lot more out of their environment using Kinetic. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Ignacio. We're gonna show you a quick view of performance. It's supposed to be the demo theater. We're gonna actually do a demo. Um, and we're gonna show you a tech preview. This is not a product announcement, but we do think and we hear from customers repeatedly that there's absolutely a need for this technology and this protocol to span tiers. So we're gonna show you an SSD in action. 
And then we're going to tie into our uh, cluster in Longmont, Colorado, and show you Kinetic working with Swift. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Hughes, and I'm going to give you a live demonstration. And everybody knows how well live demonstrations go. There are always surprises. Um, uh, what I have down here in this little, oh, sorry. This is a, something we call a developer kit, which is a little device that has four disk drives in it, 16 terabytes. You plug it into your office computer, your office LAN, and it gets a DHCP and brings up four devices. What I have down here on the floor is one of those devices. It's getting DHCP from a little Apple airport, and uh, it has three hard drives and one kinetic flash drive. This is the tech preview. This is a very low performance flash implementation. We're using the same processor on this as we use on the hard drive, so we don't expect a lot of uh, performance. And it has a flash drive and, and a lot of metal. And we're going to demonstrate the difference between those two. So uh, let me bring up the, so what we have is the system level performance. This is one disk drive, another disk drive, and these are two other disk drives. So there's four, four disk drives. Um, so what we're going to demonstrate is random write performance, random write performance. And we're able to turn around and say, okay, now we have about 60 megabytes per second, 50 to 60 megabytes per second going into that one disk drive. And that's using keys and values. Not, this is not sector level writing. This isn't, this isn't uh, actually um, uh, writing at the, at the lowest level. This is, this is writing as if it was in a file system. And down here, I can start another drive. And now we're getting around, uh, well, a total system performance of about 110 megabytes per second. 110 megabytes per second is the capacity of this Ethernet cable. right? And that's only two of the four drives being pushed. And this is random write workload, not sequential write workload. This is random write workload, which is a, which is a pretty impressive feat as far as I'm concerned. And now we can stop this, and we can turn around, and we say, OK, we want random read performance, OK? And let's go ahead and random read performance. And in this case, this is actually reading the data that was just written and being able to show, again, around 95 to 100 megabytes per second reading this data back. And I'm going to continue to go ahead and stop this. Um, we can write very small blocks, random writes of 10 bytes. What's interesting is the device itself is log structured. So as data flows in, it's immediately streamed to the disk. This means that we get very, very high random write performance. So this is, this is showing about 1,000 10-byte records. We are randomly writing 10 bytes. We're getting about 1,000 per second and 1,000 per second for a total of 2,200 uh, key value operations per second. Now, that's just streaming the data to the disk. The harder thing to do, the hardest thing to do on a disk drive is to read random data. So this is, these are two devices. This is two devices. One device is a standard four terabyte disk drive. And the other is a, the flash device, the, the 300. This is just a 300, a 240 gigabyte flash device, but with the Kinetic API. So we're able to read random read 10 bytes from the hard drive and random read 10 bytes from the flash drive. So the hard drive, the flash drive will start. We're getting around 500 key value operations per second. And these drives are just powered up. There's no, nothing in RAM. There's no, no caching. And then we can run the same test on the normal disk drive. And, and the normal disk drive, you can expect, it's a disk drive. It's got an arm. So we're, we're, we're in here in the 40, 50 range. And up there, we're in about the 500 range. We fully expect that we'll have some very high perform much, much higher performance processors on future flash devices. And that's my demonstration. And it, it worked. Okay, well, <clears throat> hola, hola. Now it's my turn. I'm going to show you guys a little bit about uh, Swift running with kinetic drives underneath it. Um, Swift has evolved a little bit since the, the initial inception of the kinetic drives. We're actually now down to the second generation, second iteration of the Swift code. 
Um, what we've done before I actually show you the, the code running is we created this concept of proxy um, object bypass, which allows the proxy server to detect the fact that there's an object server that we need to talk to that happens to be running locally in the same box. And instead of actually going through the HTTP and the whole socket and the whiskey interface from the proxy to the object server, which is what uh, Swift traditionally does, we actually bypass the code and call directly inside the Python of the proxy server the code for the, the object server. That actually uh, gives us much higher um, throughputs and much lower latencies on the, on the operations. Um, what are you doing? There we go. Ah, uh, we have slides for that. Um, awesome. So uh, in, in the case of the um, Kinetic Swift configurations, um, the deployments are usually looking at what we call, what, what is called actually in Swift, a PACO, which is a proxy that can the container on the object server running on the same box. And if you have 10 servers, all the 10 servers are running PACOs um, independently. And the other cool thing about the, the Kinetic servers, like even if you have 180 drives, or you have 1,000 drives or 20,000 drives, each single PACO can actually talk to all the drives um, regardless. It's not like you have one server for 10 drives, another server for another 10 drives. Um, now, four fingers, awesome. Now I'm going to show you uh, the system running. So top left, what I have is the edge top of one of our servers running in Colorado. It has two, uh, two chipsets, 12 cores each, so we have 24 cores up there. Um, and now what I'm going to do from another couple servers actually exercise this server directly through the, uh, the Swift interface. And I don't want to remember the thingy. There we go. Uh, so in that case, it's just one guy. And what I'm showing there is, again, Python is single process. So on one single thread on Python, that server is putting about 280 megabytes per second into the, the cluster. And the gigabytes on the other side is actually what's happening on the back of that server after replication towards the, towards the drive. So we can see that it's actually outputting to the drives 6.8 um, gigabytes per second. Now I'm going to launch a second guy from the same machine into the same server. And the aggregate between the two, once it stabilizes a little bit, in this case, from that single machine, it's somewhere on the neighborhood of like 300, 400 megabytes per second in, which is like 8 uh, gigabytes per second out. And now what we're going to do is actually start a third guy from another server, again, against the same, um, against the same pack. And we can see like between the three guys, we're looking at anywhere in between. That guy's doing 5.3, 4.2, and 3.3. So let's average to like 14 gigabytes per second uh, coming out of that proxy server into the, um, the drive mesh. And in, in this case, the, the pack was completely uh, maxed out in, in terms of CPU. So uh, with those chips, the max thing uh, we can do is about 14 gigabytes per second on the back. And mind you, the server actually only has 20 gigabits max anyway. Um, the other cool thing is like actually this server is connected to 180 drives. So actually the, the drive mesh, it's operating on a fairly low uh, capacity, about 30% uh, of the, the total drive capacity is being exercised by uh, this single packer. But it can actually drive almost a 20 gig interface from a single server. Um, so let me close those guys up. Um, the other cool thing is the configuration, and in the case of kinetic deployment, it's actually fairly simple. You create the object rings, and basically you tell each of the proxy servers, you have, well, each of the object servers that you will configure one per, um, per computer or per server, that he can talk to every single drive on your infrastructure, and off you go. Now you basically do the load balancing at the proxy level, and all your requests can then go to any single proxy, and from the proxy directly to the drive. There's no extra uh, component in there. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nacho. Thank you, Jim. Um, so real live demo, it's working. Uh, the key thing there is obviously you saw some performance data. In all the customer cases, what, what we're seeing is what I described before, which is, okay, oh, that's interesting performance. I see that I'm getting what I need. Now talk to me about the cost, right? And TCO is really the story here. So we encourage everybody to come see the booth in D11, hear more about it, talk to you about your specific needs. And then also, um, 
Lots of tools available, uh, available at developers.seagate.com. There's a fully functional drive simulator there. You can, it'll point you to where to get on GitHub all of the code, which is, again, all open source. And please get involved and come see us to learn more. Thank you very much. <laughs>